Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We are grateful that you joined us today for our conversation. This is um, Life Seg. This is Life Dialogue, and we are having conversations today about starting and running businesses in the COVID-19 era. My name is Ethel Sarah Bratton. Um, I work with Participatory Development Associates as the program coordinator for the Youth Forward Learning Partnership, and I'm going to be your host for today. This program is brought to you by YSEC, that is Youth Sector Engagement Group, uh, which is a, a youth advocacy group. YSEC uh, works uh, to promote the development of young people through doing advocacy and other dialogues and other activities to promote youth development. And YSEC is associated with the Youth Forward Initiative, which is a program funded by the MasterCard Foundation. Today's program is brought to you in collaboration with Africa Aurora Business Network, the Ghana Chamber of Young Entrepreneurs, Participatory Development Associates, and JA Venture Capital. Um, Last week, we started this series, and last week we talked about surviving as a youth startup in COVID-19 era. It was very insightful. If you missed it, don't worry. We have put the link in our chat room. You can follow that, and then you listen to it at your own convenience. But I want to be generous this morning, so I'm going to share with you a few things that I, I took home from last week's conversation. So um, I learned that if you are a youth startup in this COVID-19 era, it is important that you assess your business and how your business has been affected by COVID-19. And after you've done that, then you'll be able to re-strategize. Re-strategize means you may have to diversify the products that you deal with or change your business model. We were also told that it's important that you go low on spending in this era, and then you maintain your relationship with your clients and, and customers. Because sometimes you may have to close your business for some time before you come back. And the kind of communication you have with your customers and your clients will determine if they would want to do business with you again when you come back. You also have to seek help. By seeking help, we mean that you have to communicate now, now. with your mentors. You have to communicate with your mentors. And because your mentors have gone through a period of challenges, they've gone through crisis before, and they know how they were able to manage it. So it's a good time to talk to your mentors for them to show you the lessons that they have learned when they went through crisis. And then also we should take advantage of uh, relief packages such as the ones being done by government, corporate organizations and NGOs and, and other organizations. We should take, we should not be afraid, but we should take advantage of such um, uh, support system. And lastly, we should not be afraid. We should not give up. COVID is here for some time, but it's not going to be here forever. And so we have to still stay strong and not give up. So that's a bit of what we discussed um, last week. You follow the link and then you can get the whole conversation. So today, today promises to be very interactive as well. And we're going to talk about starting a business and running a business in the COVID-19 era and beyond. And we want to welcome you all once again. I have a fantastic, a fantastic panel of uh, panel members today to do uh, this conversation with. Would want to encourage you that you send in your comments, your your questions, your contributions. You can send it through the, 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 the chats, our Zoom chat room. You can pack them there. If you are sending a question or a comment, we would, it, would, it would be better that you caption it question or comment so that we know which category that it goes to. In the course of our conversation, we will also give a room for us to have a questions and comments session. And we do it in two ways. The first one is to put your question in the chat room and at the right time, I'll forward it to the panelists. 
Alternatively, we're going to have a video or uh, an audio live session where if you raise your hand, I can call you and then we have we listen to your question via video or audio. But a caution, remember to make sure that your background is appropriate, especially if you are talking to us via video. Okay, so um, it's time to introduce my panel to you. Uh, we have Dr. Sena Ejapong. She is a senior lecturer at Ashasi University. Uh, Dr. Sena, we are grateful. Anytime we call upon you, 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 you make time for us. So Dr. Dr. Ejapong, we would like you to tell us more about the work you do with young people. We know you do a lot of things, but tell us about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. For having me. Um, like Ethel has said, my name is Sena. My name is Sena. I teach primarily in the area of management. management. Um, two other things that I do. One is run an enterprise fund, startup. Um, has a have a trained young people in the And I hope I'm one out of every five of those five businesses. So we do a lot of work on the young. Um, as well, well I, I work with a consortium, which is um, a consortium, consortium works with um, the projects that are the, 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 um, the MasterCard And basically, what I do is the support with the business and the, um, the consortium. We do my work um, and basically what I do is film development, supporting and help execute the project, train our young people. So basically, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Japon. And we now go to our next panelist, is Kwejo Boedi Mensa. I, I work with Kwejo on the Masu project. It's, it's delightful to have you around. Kwejo, tell us more about what you do with young people. All right. Um, um, thank you, Kwejo. Happy to be here. Uh, like you said, my name is Kwejo. I work with Solid Island. Then, um, I work um, in promoting youth entrepreneurship in solidarity. So specifically, I work with Sena and Ethel on our Matu program, which seeks to encourage young people to establish innovative businesses in Koku, as well as going to Koku farming as a business. Don Coco, I also work with you in oil, power, in gold, and in Volcana, and in some of the countries that we work in, in West Africa. So basically, that's what I do. Hello, hello, Kwejo. Yeah, back to you, Ethel. Okay, I think at some point I, I couldn't hear you, but um, we'll get to hear more about what you're doing with young people and in solidarity. Our uh, uh, last panel, but definitely not the least, is John Amma. Uh, uh, John has been with us, he's a YSEC member. He wears so many hats, and last week John was our host and he did an amazing job. I'm working so hard to keep the standard that John set last week, and I hope I'll be able <laughs> to keep up with that standard. Uh, John, you are welcome. What have you been up to with young people lately? Well, um, good morning, John. Um, good morning, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm aware they're working on the sound, but I'll, again, I'll take sound, my time. But I'll, again, I'll take my time. So, um, my name is John. Um, I work in the company Venture Capital. We, we provide advisory services to MSMEs and we assist them raise capital. Over the past period, we've been helping MSMEs um, in terms of their resilience. 
and how they scale up with their needs, needs and, and, to and to grow on their own. All right, thank you very much, John. Um, you're welcome. Um, if you just joined us, this is the YSEC Dialogue, the second version. We've already shared the link to the first one in our chat uh, room. Today we are discussing starting and running a business in the COVID-19 era and beyond. I just introduced my panelists to you and we're just about to start our conversation. So um, COVID-19 needs no introduction. It's taking over our lives, our lifestyles, uh, our economic activities, people have lost their livelihood. It's, it's been a livelihood shock for most people. It's, and people who have no fallback mechanism have felt it so strongly. And we've gone through different cycles of uh, challenges and negativity, going through the lockdown, the stress and the mental challenges and mental stress that comes with it. The, enforcement of social distancing uh, protocols, and then all, which, is all, which has also affected our, our livelihoods. Uh, there seems to be so much gloom and negativity with regards to COVID. But today we say we're talking about starting a business. Is it even possible to start a business? Uh, everything looks so gloomy and bad. Is there a silver lining somewhere? Do we have a ray of hope anywhere? Dr. Japan? Tell us about that. Um, so my philosophy in life actually is that in every situation you find yourself in, you assess and see what your are lining are. Um, no matter how terrible, usually there is a silver lining. With COVID as well, um, two things, the key silver lining that I identify of an entrepreneur um, that, that it actually pushes young people to bring out the best thing. Um, in, in our comfort zone, the, the more innovation out and a requirements to change the process that you are going through. And so in our comfort zone, we get comfortable with that and not doing much. And because of that, the patient can actually start up. So one of the key things that I think this pandemic has been the for is innovation. Um, and the lockdown was great because then we were all stuck in our rooms. We didn't have an option but to think. And in that thinking and in that reflection, um, you actually birth new ideas. You are able to innovate around some of the things that you are doing and um, sort of assess the things that you are not doing too right and the things that you are doing okay. So that is one silver lining that it, it helps to birth innovation and then it helps that it has actually helped the entrepreneur to sit back and think or the young person to sit back and think um, about themselves, about their environment, about everything they've been doing so far. Um, it also has helped entrepreneurs. You know, there was almost a mad rush for entrepreneurship in the country, and every young person was sort of starting one thing or the other. Now, I think what this has actually done also is to help us identify those who actually have built the resilience and the toughness that is required um, to go through a pandemic like this. Um, and so, now you fall within, you think about yourself and you fall within yourself to see how tough you are, how resilient you are and how able you are. Then when you step out, you actually step out and do something that will cause a change. Um, the other key thing is that it has introduced a ton of opportunities. Some of the opportunities are short lived, some of them will be long lived. And so that in itself gives us a lot of, you know, room to think, to create, um, to start businesses and to make life actually a bit more comfortable for everyone, looking at the situations that we find ourselves in. And last, the last um, silver lining I would mention is the fact that a lot of businesses exist and do not think about, you know, succession planning and risk management. Um, people start and they run. And usually there's, of course, there's a mad rush. There are lots of people, there's opportunity. We don't even have the, 
we don't sit back to think, but this actually has forced people to realize that it's important to think through your processes and very importantly, think about what risk management plans you put in place for all sorts. And it's everyday known risk to unknown risk to unknown unknown risk, um, which could be a pandemic of this sort, right? So those are some of the key things that I think this pandemic has brought to the fore where starting a business and even running a business is concerned. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Kwejo, can you share some thoughts on this, on, on, on the silver linings this brings? Because we've talked about opportunities, short-term, long-term opportunities. Can you share some with us? Yes, so um, since the period of the lockdown, we've had interactions with some of the young people we are working with, and actually, this period has given them a lot of time to reflect and a lot of time, a lot of them has also discovered things that were around them that uh, they didn't pay particular attention to. But the chaotic situation we find ourselves in, they've discovered the opportunities in some of these things to be able to make a business out of it. So for example, some of the young people, a lot of the young people we talked about are looking at digital financial um, digital finance, how they can leverage on it as people are now afraid to even touch money. So a lot of these young um, people are now looking at things around us and seeing how they can innovate and um, thrive and survive on it. And also, even those that we've worked with and are actually in business are now looking for for innovative ways of delivering the products and services they are delivering. So um, a lot of the young people we are engaged with who are providing services to farmers are now looking at how they can mechanize the operations to be able to reach a lot more farmers in these times and also how they can interact with um, their clients virtually, even in the space in which they are. So, in the areas where connectivity is a problem, they are still using social media and uh, virtual means, simple telephone calls to be able to uh, establish these relationships and keep their businesses going and also look for new opportunities around them. So we've mentioned some of uh, the, 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 the silver linings from Dr. Senna's perspective and then Kwejo. John, um, uh, do you also agree that indeed, even in COVID-19, there seems to be a lot of negativity, but in, there is some sort of uh, silver lining and some opportunities in there for young people to start businesses? Well, um, Ethel and the panelists who um, all joined us and the participants who are here, um, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, if you look at the, the general flow of um, COVID, what we've seen has been some disruption to a lot of things, um, to inventory in terms of supply to, to companies. We have seen the effect of it in terms of even projects that um, had some funding that have been halted and so on and so forth. Um, we've seen a general decline in consumer spending um, and realignment of that spending to other sectors of the economy um, and, and, and other functional areas. We've also seen some restriction in movements among others. The implications for this on the general economy is there's been a, a shrink in GDP and in growth forecast for many of these businesses. So to ask a young person to start a business in this time is to do really a cashew analysis of what are the good potential and how do I diversify products if I'm an existing player or what should, what should, what should a sector focus look like and which part of the value chain should I focus on in, in my business. But you've got to play it back a bit for many young people. Because of these times that we're in, you've got to ask yourself, what is my personal development plan for the next three, four years? Because really, you may be home, you may have extra time. to so do a SWOT on yourself and figure out which parts of my life do I need to improve on? Do I need to improve upon my, my skills development? So skills development is one of the key areas that youth must focus on. How do I, how do I, how do I upgrade my skills? Whether you are in the rural sector or the, or the formal sector, or even in, in, in the urban sectors, you've got to have that conversation with yourself because um, um, planting seasons have been affected and so on and so forth. You have businesses that traditionally were brick and mortar that you expect people to interact with you are not interacting with you. So skills upgrading is one of the key things you've got to look at. 
within your personal development plan. Do a SWOT analysis on yourself, figure out what your strengths are, your weakness, opportunities, and threats, figure out how do you build these skills. There are digital opportunities for you. Uday Me, there's Coursera, which allows you to take digital courses online to build your, 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 your skills base and improve in your life. It's also a good time for you to volunteer for firms and, and a couple of others because this is the best time to gain experience to even start yours. But to learn under the feet of those who have triumphed and who've learned, I mentioned elsewhere that there's a report by John Statton it's on, as an enterprise map of, of Ghana on the key opportunities that have happened since 1960 and so on and so on. Businesses that have thrived and, and have, have been resilient. You can learn from that. And this. So volunteering means that, look, companies may not be able to pay you the, the right amounts that, that you want, maybe 100% salary. So they put you on something before a fellow where they're paying you about 30%. It's good because it's a sacrifice that you're doing to ensure that the business grows and stays and you can provide some skill. You can also do mentorship among others. If you take the agricultural base of, of the economy, you, you now look at what part of the value chain can you go into. So you have seeds, you have seed production, you have input, inputs that you can supply to farmers. Like you said, you have credit financing schemes that you can explore within, within that side. In terms of sector focus, you have opportunities now in food. A lot of people are going to food, a lot of people are going to healthcare, a lot of people are going into small scale manufacturing, a lot of people are going into digital services, e-commerce platforms, onboarding, a lot of people are doing sales, um, onboarding and so on and so forth. A lot of people um, are, 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 are finding ways to be, to be, to be relevant to this, to this market. So in conclusion, if you're a young person seeking to start a business, within this period, you've got to first of all, examine yourself, your skills, um, your, 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 your weakness, opportunities and threats, then do a case analysis of the stakeholders that you want to interact with within the system. Who is the primary stakeholder? Who is the secondary stakeholder? What is the needs? What are the needs that are available within this market? What are the problems? Which part of the value chain do I want to focus on? Then narrow it down into what sectors do I want to play in? Is it food, et cetera, et cetera? Then build the relevant assumptions to it in terms of what will cash flow look like? What does lifetime value of of the consumer look like? What point do I have to iterate as a business? And then figure out really, in terms of three years, what is a good plan for yourself? And if you're an existing person working for someone, what you are saying is that it's a good time to volunteer. It's a good time to also, also make some sacrifices for the firm. It's a good time to, to be under some sort of mentorship to learn from others and help them be resilient as well. Um, thank you very much, John. And so now we, 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 have an, we all agree that um, Despite the challenges, challenging situation that we are in, uh, there are lots of opportunities, short term to uh, medium term and long term opportunities that young people can take advantage of to even start businesses. Um, now I want us to look at uh, how we can identify some of those opportunities. And I want us to really cast our net wide, considering both rural and urban areas. Because although COVID-19, um, Accra, the, the Accra metropolitan, greater Accra metropolitan area is leading in terms, in terms of cases, rural communities have also been affected by COVID. Um, how do we identify opportunities? If I'm a young person and I want to go into a business um, at the moment, how can I even identify existing or emerging opportunities in this era? Um, we'll start with Dr. Sena. Okay. Um, opportunity identification is, is a process. Um, in John's submission, he's mentioned a number of low-hanging fruits that young people can, can look at. And the, the options that he mentions um, span both the, the rural and the urban spaces. Now, it's very important that one understands and knows this process that they need to go through. Um, and it starts from looking within your environment, doing an assessment of what an environmental scan of sorts to gain a very good appreciation of who needs what. And that brings in the conversation around opportunity entrepreneurship and necessity entrepreneurship, where you are looking at addressing either a problem, a pain, a need, or some, some challenge that somebody has. Because once you start from that perspective, then it guarantees you um, a customer base, which is what you need to be able to turn around. Because the whole essence of 
of, of entrepreneurship is to be able to turn around and to be able to arrive at some revenue generation model. Now, whether you are a social enterprise or you are a, profit, a pure profit-making venture, you still need that business case that will help you to be able to turn things around. And the group or the stakeholder group that will help you do that is your customer base. So it's very important that you ensure that you understand very clearly what problem, pain, um, challenge, desires people within your environment have um, through some initial research and matching that to whatever idea you come up with. Now, once you come up with the idea, and you know, a lot of times when um, we think about ideas, we think about you know coming up with new things, out of the box things, right? Sometimes it's the simplest things around us, like providing access to something that is already existing. So um, typical example, lockdown, we can't go out, but I need food, right? Delivery then becomes a solution that I'll be seeking. Now, there are a number of delivery companies out there. Do I know how to find them? Still, like up to date, when I'm looking for an Okada driver, it's not the rider, it's not the easiest of things for me to find, right? Um, is there a way in which someone, a young person somewhere can come up with a system that helps us to identify these riders very easily? I know a couple of people who are exploring this particular opportunity already, right? But sometimes it's really looking within the systems, the value chains, the um, supply chains that exist and identifying, you know, the gaps and the lapses within these chains, um, considering the situation that you find yourself in and the environment you find yourself in. And so opportunity is not always like that bright idea, that new thing that hasn't happened yet. Sometimes it's a little things to connect you know, some of the existing things. And um, I recommend those who come to read about Dublin's 10 types of innovation, because he does mention the different types of um, innovations that businesses can come up with. And it also helps to identify opportunities that um, young people can, or people who are now looking to go into entrepreneurship can start from. Um, now, back to my point about opportunity entrepreneurship and necessity entrepreneurship. Now, once you are able to identify a very clear opportunity within your space based on or based off of a need, a pain, etc., then it makes it easy for you to develop a solution, a holistic solution, because in your mind, you are very clear who your customer is and what they need and what their challenges. And so you are able to achieve what we call the problem solution fit very well. Now, once you have that, then it is validation, and that actually guarantees better success for businesses. Um, necessity entrepreneurship typically is, I have need for money, and I get up and I see people selling scratch card out there, so I also get up and go and start selling scratch card. Usually, there's not a lot of research that will go into um, a situation like that, and um, the, the, the whole assessment and validation is slightly weaker. And so the chances of survival of such businesses is usually lower. And I mean, globally, one out of three would survive, of a startup, of startups would survive. And that number is even increasing. And so you want a situation where you actually do your homework very well to be able to identify. And basic point is look at existing value chains, existing um, supply chains, existing systems, and identify gaps and loopholes. Look at the people within your environment to identify problems, pains, challenges they have, and try to address these for them, right? So it is falling back on the things that you know, falling back on the things that you don't know. And John did mention in his submission that there's a lot of knowledge out there. So just you going out there and seeking the right knowledge to be able to start and finding mentorship and um, coaching is very key, right? No, no one person has it all is, is one of my principles. Um, and so it's very important that you have someone who has done it before or someone who is doing it and engage that person in conversation to be able to understand and appreciate, you know, what you are fully, you are fully faced with. But remember, it's not just about starting. It is about the ability to go the long haul. Um, I have seen in, in training young entrepreneurs, I've seen so many people excited about starting and thinking they want to be their own bosses, but um, inside of them, they lack what it takes to actually make it happen and 
um, go through the pains and the downs and the loneliness and all of that that comes with it. So entrepreneurship is not something for the mean hearted. Um, you can be entrepreneurial in your head and work for an organization. And like John again said, you can volunteer, you can do new things, help things within the organization, help with um, new product development and stuff like that and stay in the comfort of the organization. But once you decide to step out and venture out, you should know what the risks are and be ready to actually see it through, right? So, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, I think we just joined Dr. Japan's entrepreneurship class <laughs> today. Thank you so much for your uh, submission. Um, so, so now that we know uh, how to identify these opportunities, uh, Kwejo, I, I would also want you to, to add on um, the people who are absent, so in this current situation, are there specific sector that is booming? Is there a sector that I have to go in? Uh, because they're having a hard time going through the whole, you know, rigorous process that the Tassena has taken. But some people just want to know, okay, this sector is booming, and then they just go straight to do their research on, on that uh, specific sector or value chain. All right, thank you, Ethel, um, and my co-panelists and those who have joined us from around the world. So um, let's take a step back uh, before we go into the sectors that uh, young people can go in. So Dr. Sena talked about necessity entrepreneurship and opportunity entrepreneurship. So young people, first of all, have to be very deliberate and develop their entrepreneurial characteristics. That's the first thing. To be able to be resilient in these times, we need to be very deliberate and develop our skills in entrepreneurship. And um, um, John talked about a lot of resources around. Uh, there are Coursera, there are a lot of virtual learning platforms where young people can actually go on and develop these skills and also find new knowledge on how to implement new businesses or even run the businesses that they are in. So in terms of the sectors that young people can go in, you know, I always want to talk about the young people in my village, Edgegrain, uh, because those in Accra have a lot of opportunities. But thankfully, even in the midst of uh, COVID, we all need food. So Agric is an area that young people, even in urban areas, can look to. But then in looking at agri, we need to also look at innovation. How do we bring innovation into agri in order to increase productivity and uh, make sure we survive uh, within this time? So agri is uh, a sector that young people can go into. Um, we can look at the entire value chain from production to processing. So there are opportunities in primary production and there are opportunities in value addition among very uh, commodity chains. So cocoa, oil palm, uh, grains, and all those things are um, things that young people can go into. And another thing that is also something that has become very uh, important uh, for us to overcome COVID has been the technology sector. So, that's an area where young people can also look to, but that's an area where you have to also go in with a lot of thinking. Um, you don't just see people doing online delivery apps and so you also jump in and do it. You need to very deliberate and go through the processes that were outlined by Dr. Senna. So in conclusion, what I would like to add is that in whatever sector the young people identify opportunities, there are, few key, uh, there are a few key things that they must look to. They must be very deliberate. In Ghana, a lot of young people uh, go into businesses without proper planning. So we have the ideas in our head and they just jump in. But we must be very deliberate, have a plan and follow the plan. But in these times, we must make sure we review the plan and iterate as we go. So that's the first key thing. The second key thing is keeping records of what we are doing. So a lot of people want to start businesses. Uh, they are doing opportunity research, 
but they are not even recording the findings that they, they are having. So they are in their heads. So as they move along, they are not able to come back to use the knowledge that they had in the first place. So records keeping is something that is key for every business, whether you are starting or you are at some stage uh, in running the business. So the three key things uh, are developing their skills, um, records keeping, and planning and being deliberate about what you want to do. And I think if young people do this, there are a lot of opportunities out there. And then with proper opportunity research, they'll be able to discover what is uh, within their environment and go into such opportunities. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. And um, we are also live on Facebook. You can get your contacts to, to join us. This is a very interesting and then educative conversation that we have in here. So uh, we are live on, uh, you can join us on Facebook, uh, PDA Ghana. Thank you. Um, our, our, our participants, as I said, we want this to be very interactive. So as we're talking, we raise the topic and then we discuss and you can send in your, your ideas or your comments or your suggestions. We're talking about opportunities. If you know any, kindly send it to the chat room and then we'll be able to share with uh, uh, other participants too. So please, the chat room is there. Please put your ideas there so that I will be able to share it with everyone um, soon. Okay, and um, so so far it's, it's interesting. I am learning a lot today about uh, going into business. You just don't wake up one morning and then you say, okay, everybody is an entrepreneur now, so I want to go into entrepreneurship. We've talked about doing research on the opportunity or the necessities. Is the opportunity and necessity entrepreneurship? That's that's so interesting um, to know. Um, and John, uh, could you talked about uh, activities in rural areas. So we, we, the city people, are there any uh, opportunities that we can take advantage of in this era? Please highlight on some to us. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. So the network was acting up a bit. But I think fantastic submissions from Doc and, and Kojo. I'm terrific to hear. What I'll just do is to build on what they've said so far. Now, when you're starting a business, you know, there are businesses that will require little capital and there are those that require a lot of capital to start, depending on the sector that you're going into. So it's important to understand what the dynamics are in starting that business, whether you need some financing here and there, some partners here and there, you would explore that value chain that has been expressed so far. I mean, come to think of it, there are businesses that you can start and have a business like rabbit farming, beekeeping, and snail farming, and so on and so forth, depending on where you are. But this has got to be built on what we call an investment thesis. The investment thesis essentially says that in mapping out these opportunities that I want to enter into, in mapping out the value chain and which sector I want to play in, what would happen? How would this business go? How do I make money? So there are two things that, that, that determine the investment thesis. One is the staying potential the earning potential, and, the, and then fact, there's a the last one, the pain potential. So I have an article out that says, have 100 businesses that you can start with 100 Ghana cities. So for anyone who's listening to us, you can Google it and see what it says. So staying potential, will my business be sustainable in its growth? Earning potential, will the products that I'm mapping out be enough to bring me some relevant revenue to be able to grow and live off it? So it's not a, just enough to say that, I'm passionate about this idea and I want to start. I've seen a comment from someone who look at the financing part. It's not just um, in a bit. It's not just enough to say I'm starting a business because I'm passionate about it. It's, it's good to look at it from a holistic business case perspective. How does this grow? What is the staying potential of this product or service? And then what is the earning potential of this, this product or service? And then you've got to look at who can pay for this service and that defines your customer classes among others. So typically what we tell you to do is that you want to build what you call the, the assumptions around these ideas that Doc has told you you can look out for, the necessity or the, or, or, or the others that she mentioned or the opportunity that, that comes in. Here, build your operational structure. What will it take for me to start this business? What will my running costs be like? You understand, you've got to look at that. Then you've got to look at what key equipments do I need to be able to operationalize this business? This then gives you, this is what we call the capital expenditure. This then gives you an idea of what sort of raw material base or what sort of operational cost base you need to be able to run your business. 
then you've got to then define the product classes in terms of, oh, so this idea that I have is relevant for X market. I'm expecting about 2% revenue from this particular product. I'm expecting about 5% revenue from, sometimes when you start a business, it's not so clear to know whether X will make money or Y will make money, but at least it must be informed by data. And the data are what we call the operational assumptions. What is my yield rate like for, for, my, um, for my farm? What is my yield rate like for, for my, my processing firm? And, and then you look at the other percentages. What percentage of mobile money payments am I expecting? What percentage, what, how, how will I operate in peak seasons? What will marketing look like? All of these things have got to be informed, have got to inform the assumptions you build in your cash flow analysis. The next thing you've got to look at is that as a business owner, do I have the capacity to run this business? Have been spotted opportunity. So here you've got to look at the business anatomy itself. What key departments must be created in my business? Who are the functional people I'll need to bring on board to drive this growth in delivering, in delivering that service? Often what people don't do is to do a risk analysis. If I'm starting my business as an entrepreneur, what if, the what if scenarios? What if things don't go right? What do I do? Is it a good time to quit my business and go into, uh, quit my job and go into business? Those things have got to be very informed decisions that you take in, 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 in starting that business. Now, when you spotted the opportunity, it's also the key thing you want to look at, which is what documents do I need to put in place to be able to present this investment thesis to partners, to financiers, even for you to be able to document your history in doing that. So here you're looking at investment, what we call the information memorandum, or otherwise what people will accept as a pitch document. People are looking for financial plan as well. And then people are looking for off-takers and so on and so forth. Off-takers here guarantee you some sort of financing. Then there are those that may want to look at what we call invoice discounting as a factor of function. Here what we are saying is that, assuming that you're already producing um, for, for X or Y person, and you want to enter into new markets, are there firms or institutions that you can go to and trade off that invoice that you have already worked for, for some percentage of, 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 of capital, be able to move into different areas. Among others. So, in, in conclusion, have an investment thesis. Be sure about which sector you're playing into and what the capital needs are, and build the relevant docs to be able to, to validate those assumptions that you have. And then you can decide to start small to prove those assumptions. Or if you're an existing player, begin to look at which key areas of my business do I need to realign costs and, and, and diversify products but also look at which people I need to bring on board to be, to be relevant to that market. And then also look at in the product analysis what will my revenue structure look like, and then what does my CAPEX and OPEX structure look like, and be able to validate these things in supporting opportunity. Okay, uh, thank you very much, John. We, we, we are learning a lot today, so I will cross over to our comment, our chat room, and take a submission from one of our participants. So, so this is from Marina Abba to, to all of us. And then she, um, the message is that the challenge we're looking for lower hanging fruit when it comes to identifying business opportunities is the fact that everyone can have access to those ones and then they crowd the space. It makes it less profitable. And as Pedro said, we must find your calling. You have to be deliberate in what you want to do, research well on it, identify what the, listen, the missing links are, or oh, that's the weakness, and then you go into it to find solutions to it, yes. And this is very common. You realize in a Ghanaian context, sometimes you see there is a challenge. Then one person goes into that business, and before you realize, within one community, you have about a small catchment, you have about 10 people solving the same problem, and then they just destroy the market. So it's not really just seeing somebody doing something, and so you also want to go into it, as we have learned today. Starting a business is a very deliberate action that you need to reflect on it. You need to seek knowledge from people. You need to read about it. You need to do a lot of reflection and a lot of research to be able to come out with a product that you know that you already have the market so that you don't start midway and then you get stuck. Then the next moment we are, kind, we are counting you as a statistic of the number of young businesses that start and then within three years they collapse. And we, we, we are grateful. Keep your, your comments coming, and then uh, we will read them. We have another one uh, that talks, that's from this morning. And this morning says, I've always wanted to go into mobile healthcare, which I understand is kind of expensive, as, as to building a website, the mobile app, the registration, and what I can think of. 
how do I secure funding? So that's more, you just moved as to what we were about to discuss. And so funding, uh, funding has always been a huge issue for young people. Even the young people that we work with on our projects, <laughs> Dr. Sedna, John and Pedro, we all know we've been struggling for funds for the young people. And now that it's COVID-19, people are doing less spending. People are not even willing to, to give out money because we don't even know what happens tomorrow. And it is in this era that we are saying it's a good time to start business uh, because there, there is a silver lining here. Now, how do we find funding? We've, we've heard of juicy, juicy COVID relief package. Um, what are the names? Stimulus package. Uh, COVID resilience and recovery fund, nice, nice, big, huge names. And can we take advantage of some of these opportunities? Will you even help us? Is it the right thing to do when we are considering funding for starting our business, especially in an era where we are managing a crisis? And we will start from Dr. Senna. Thank you, thank you, Ethel. <laughs> I should just get ready to start all the time. It works. <laughs> um, so hmm, funding, funding is a big one. Um, interestingly, Ethel, a lot of times when I'm talking to people who work with funding agencies, what they tell me is that they can't find businesses to fund. And then I work with entrepreneurs. And what I hear from my people is that we can't get funding. And so very clearly, there's a missing link between the two. And it's actually one of the areas that um, a colleague of mine and I have started exploring to see what, what really is this missing link? Because there's been a lot of interventions, a lot of efforts um, to bridge this gap, but it seems it's still there. And from the perspective of a lot of entrepreneurs I work with, it seems it's even growing. So what really is happening in, in that space? So I'm actually looking forward a lot to what Kwejo and John will have to say to this. Um, but what I, would, what I would put in there as tips for somebody who is starting, because um, I work with very early stage people. And usually, so the people I work with, John would take after I have worked with them and move on. And so if you want to connect our conversation very well, Take mine as the basis and then John's as, you know, the, the, the next step to it, right? Um, but from where I sit, I would say that start lean. I meet too many people who want to start a business. You have not even validated the business yet. And they are looking for people to put money in it. And my question to them is, will you put your last penny on this? If what you are starting hasn't been validated to the point where you are convinced that you can withdraw all of your savings and put on it, don't go out there asking for money because you are not going to get it. Now, there are different funding, like funding, um, should I say, institutions and the point at which they come in. So at the very early stage, the advice is that you look at your own personal savings. And that is why people would say that don't start entrepreneurship too early when you have nothing. At least work a little, get a little money. Or if you have a cocoa farm in your family, so you have some money in your family. I'm using that figuratively. So you have some money in your family that you can fall off. There are friends who believe in you so you can fall on them. Fall on those funds because those are the monies that are available for very early stage work. Now, I did mention earlier on that I manage a fund for our entrepreneurs, our entrepreneurs on campus. Now, these entrepreneurs are very super early stage, right? There's no way I would expect that an incubator will pick them up or an accelerator will pick them up or they will go and pitch at some seed startup organization and whatnot and make some money. No. And because of that, I have taken it upon myself with my colleagues and we go out there to find money from friends and sympathizers of my university, which is Ashesi University. And they give us money as an educational support to help these young people to get started. Usually it's not even adequate. And so what I tell them is that you should be willing to put a little of your own pocket money on the line as well. 
Now, once you use those funds to do the initial validation and exploration, be sure that there's a good problem solution fit, be sure that there's a market for you so you have a good product um, market fit as well, then you can stand in front of someone and tell a story. Now, even that, the advice is that you speak to angel investors who fall within the network that you exist in, right? Um, because these angels have their own money and typically they are looking either to support young people or they are looking for the next big thing to invest in. So that sort of makes it easy for you to get funds from them. But you can't go stand in front of an angel and ask them um, to give you money for a business, an idea that you haven't even validated. So you don't have a business concept. All you have is, a, is an idea. You are not going to get money from an angel. And then from there, you move to more sophisticated um, systems like venture capitalists and whatnots and whatnots that you know other people deal with. <laughs> but basically, you should appreciate where within the life cycle you are at and what kind of funders would be willing to give you money. And so what I always say, say is that from the beginning, start lean. Now, the second point I'd like to make is that these funders fund entrepreneurs and their teams. Now, I see too many times where a single person, no track record, no nothing, no nothing, like nothing, and they go out and they want to get money. Now, I'm not going to give my money to you because I'm working hard to make my money. So I'm not going to give it to you because after like due diligence, you don't convince me that you deserve my money, right? And so it's important that you, the entrepreneur, are positioned to attract money. You should be able to draw money towards you. You have to have good traction within the, the market and the space. Then you can be assured of the fact that the money will come to you, even money from family and friends and the proverbial fools that give us money sometimes, you can't just go to get them and get money. You need to have some soundness in, in your idea, right? Or the business model, if you've gotten to that point, before they can give you some money. And so it's very important that you place yourself well and build a sound team. And this team is not my friend and my friend and my friend, but it's a team of people who complement each other and actually bring together skills, capacity, resources that can help you build the, the business you want to build, right? So you don't get Senna and say that, Senna, come and help me build what kind of business? Um, something in machine intelligence and whatnot. I could come in with a business support side of things, but you don't put me there and say that I'm one of the technical people. I don't have any technical skills in machine intelligence, for example. So it should be team members who are relevant to what it is that, that you are doing. So you, the start lean, you, the entrepreneur, make sure that you are the point where you can actually get, you know, the kind of attention you need. And thirdly, make sure that you have a team, right? Now, after you have these things, then very likely money out there will flow to you. Because honestly, Ethel, so many times I hear people with money saying that we can't find businesses. Now, moving into the, moving into the rural space, the situation is slightly different there in that these folk do not even have access to you know, the savings that you need to get started. The, the, the exciting thing there is that with at least the rural businesses that I've seen, the capital they need to validate their business ideas is not a lot. Now, I get tired of hearing us going outside of our continent to find money. What are we doing on our continent? We understand our people. Now, I can put 100 cities down towards a fund that is going towards helping people in the rural areas. And I can bet you that a thousand other people, maybe a million other people in Ghana can afford to do the same. If we all put 100 cities together, we build a fund that can help us support people in rural communities to start. It is high time we started looking within and it's high time we started you know, giving our money towards some of these things, right? We can't always go out. And if you are looking at Ghana beyond aid, then we, <laughs> we don't have an option but to really look within. So that, that will be my, my thoughts on you know, how we can find money. Start lean, make sure you are of good repute, have a good organization to work with you, Go out there and address people who are at the life cycle stage that you are at as a business. And then for the rest of us, 
let's put our money in it. Let's help our small businesses actually get started. Right. Okay. And um, thank you very much. That was very deep, especially the part about we looking within, pulling our resources together to fund business ideas of young people. And we will now move to John because I know that this is your area. We mentioned, I think Sana mentioned venture capital. Uh, those are big words. Some of us don't even understand. What is this angel investors, venture capital, COVID relief fund, stimulus package? Can, can you break it down so that we, the lay people, can understand and then we'll be able to know where we can even, how we can even, I think Sana talked about how we can position ourselves to even uh, qualify for some of uh, this funding. But how do we even assess, what is it in the first place? And how, do, how can we even have access to some of this uh, funding? I feel like this is a PhD question at this point. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think Jock has done a fantastic way laying out the, the framework. Let me look at it from this perspective. To raise money, you've got to identify what the need for the money is. So a lot of people start up and they think, oh, I'm going out to raise money. I don't know what they need the money for or what the funder would pay for within the scheme of things. So it's important to then identify clearly what the purpose of the money is. Is it for raw material? Is it for skills development? Is it for, for organizational development? Is it project-based financing? What is it? Is it to acquire raw materials? These things then define what the various financing options are. So let me then highlight what the financing options are, and then later on I'll end with who and who play within that space. Is that okay? Now, if you pick these guys who are looking for funding, they form, they're in different classes of businesses. You have the early stage, you have the good stage, you have the mature stage businesses. Even within the early stages, within the, the confines of Ghanaian law, you have micro, small, medium enterprises. And at that, you have the household enterprises, which are family, friends, and so on and so forth. The typical rigor in a banking situation would not apply to these people. I'll speak to it in the show. So they'll be looking for more short-term capital. They're looking for uh, not collateral-based financing, but what kind of systems are you looking at? I'll look at that in a bit. So if you take the rural person who's looking for financing, his needs may be different from that which is in the formal sector. Now, for due diligence purposes, you've got to ask yourself whether I'm investment ready or I want to grow on my books. So typically what we would consider would be whether or not you're growing on a bit, a bit that which is earnings before interest um, or you're growing on earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization. These are fi financial things that you've got to consider when you're looking to raise money. And like, like, like Doc said, you move from your small baby steps, you have come to us and we would explain that to you. So it's important that your financial planning process is key when you're doing that. Now, here, typically we're asking you for certain things. For example, have you considered what your repayment schedule will look like, which in the jargons, they call it amortization, right? You've got to also consider as a business that if I were to take on equity, how much of it am I giving out? And what does my legal structure look like currently? As an enterprise, you are restricted from getting some capital unless you're signing on partnership agreements, which really the risk is borne by the investor who's coming in because they are not part of the business, but of course they may be protected by some legal agreement. So you've got to look at that in, in that. You want to ask yourself whether as a business, you've considered the rate of interest in paying for these facilities if you are picking up a loan. Will it be good for you? How should it be structured? Should it be a term loan in terms of quarterly payments and so on? Do I need a moratorium among others? You've got to look at that in your, in your analysis. Then you've got to look at whether or not you have off takers as a business. Am I raising capital on the on the on the on the on the on the premise of a contract I've signed with maybe National Buffer Stock Company to provide goods to them. Am I raising capital because I've done some work for, for MTN, and I'm waiting for MTN to pay me, so I need some money. All these will determine the kinds of money that you're looking for. Now, if this is for a typical person who is even going to, 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 to the market to borrow. So let's say you are doing debt finance. So there are two types, types. There's equity financing and debt financing. And the debt financing, you are what you call invoice discounting. Invoice discounting is when you are work for X party, who is what you call a good payer or a good obligor. So this person then says that I will pay you, you, you have done this work for MTN, MTN will pay me in 30 days. So instead of waiting for that 30 days, you would rather have this person finance you. And then when the, you establish an escrow account, a joint account, 
when they pay you, they take their money out of it at a small fee. That's one. Number two, we've got something called supplier's credit, where essentially you're saying that, given that I'm importing raw materials, I would need X type of facility from this person to be able to bring in, tied to what we call a letter of credit among others. So LCs are things that were applied to the former business also. Now, the LCs don't come cheap. They come at a cost. That's why we always advise entrepreneurs, don't start off with debt unless you can handle debt. Some debt is good, others are bad. Ideally, there are always businesses that have liabilities and those that don't have liabilities. So these also determine how the funding will go. Now, when you move from this era of the debt financing, you come into equity financing. Now, under equity financing, so in fact, I left one out under the debt financing. It's what we also call convertible debt. A convertible debt essentially says that if you are even targeting your father or your mother or your auntie or friend, and you are in the village or elsewhere, and you say, please, can you take a payroll loan for me because you are on salary for me to start? Or you say that, oh, if you have some money, give it to me at this debt rate. Let's say 40. Don't borrow more than the T bill rate or T bill plus two or plus three. If you go and do that, you will kill your business unless your business can handle that debt. Now, when you take on that capital as debt, you then tell the person that, look, give me a grace period of six months. After the six months, I can pay you principal plus interest, or I pay you just the interest and pay you principal at the end of the contract period. But the good thing for startups is that you can then tell the person, at the end of that period, because you're one of my first investors, I'll convert the money that I, you have given me into equity into the business. So most people are favoring convertible debt now. Okay, now there are two types and then we'll end. So there's the equity type as well. The equity has to do with business angels. Angel investors like Doc said, these are people who have some middle class persons, young adults who have some disposable income or some investment that they are looking to um, put in some business or some opportunity. Your investment thesis here is key. What is the growth rate for the business what percentage of interest do they get from giving you that business? And this is defined by your cash flow analysis, which most people, people fail to do. So they do three years and they say, oh, I'll pay you in three years. Yet their net profit is 20,000 or 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. They've gone for 30,000. When do you think you pay the person back? In fact, out of that 2,000, the person already ha only has 10% shares in your business. So do 10% of the 2,000. He has given you 20,000 and you pay in three years, realistically, no. So these are some of the things that you must think. Now, when you look at the equity part, you've got to look at the, the due review forms that should be required to fail as well. There are minority investors and then there are majority investors within that line. Then finally, you have what you call the grant or grant matching institutions. Now, this is what happens. Typically, a firm may say that I will match the funding that you have if you're able to raise 30%. There are those that also say that, look, for this money that you seek, there are a number of, of, of scenarios that you have to present what you call an RFP. Do you respond to an RFP with a proposal? And that proposal has a format that you have to follow through. And there are M&E components that you have to look at in the disbursement of funds, which goes and ties into appropriate bookkeeping, among others. So in conclusion, there are business angels, there are accelerator programs that may offer grants and 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 capital for you to start. The others that provide working capital, and then there are there are, are institutional investors or family or VCs, venture capital firms. Venture capital firms essentially mean that look, these are either institutions or persons that have come together, pooled resources, and put it into a fund. And the fund has a return, a return on investment rate. So if you go and give them a rate that has not applied to them, they will not give you money. Not all venture capital firms invest in all businesses. Some are sector specific. They do maybe just food. So you don't just go sharing your pitch documents with everyone. Finally, people invest in people and not necessarily the business. Because sometimes you may not have, you may have zero traction, zero validation, but then you're forceful, you're tenacious. You have an idealistic view that is hinged on some basic facts or assumptions based on the documents that you present. And so people want to raise capital with you. Always determine the needs and then figure out how you go from there. For the rural guy who is in, who is in, um, 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 Bantama or who is in Laura or something. There are guarantor schemes that you can also join. And these guarantor schemes, I have to address them, otherwise we'll be in trouble. So the guarantor schemes are essentially um, input support schemes where there are credit terms you can go 
and get some hold, get some uh, um, seats and so on. And you pay after a while uh, for these for, for these guys to, to look at. And there are those that you start small. I'll leave it here for now. Oh, someone says Bantama is not rural. Forgive me. I'm just using that as part of the analysis. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we have the process. You may have to buy a ram, you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Otherwise, you, you have to get a very huge ram to, no. to use for the pacification. Okay. Um, that was educative. I think we, we probably need a whole session on fandom because um, from all that John said, I have learned that there's huge technicalities with looking for fandom and even known for your business. So you just don't say, okay, I have a business idea, I need a loan. No, uh, it goes back to the research. It goes back to understanding which cycle, which business cycle, uh, which stage of the business cycle are you in? Are you in the early stage? Are you in the growth stage? Are you in the maturity stage? What sector are you working in? Who is ready to fund you? And last, and what he said, that people invest in people. So it goes back to say that when we started this, we said that the first thing you will want to do is to invest in yourself and understand what you are about. There are some skills that you, you, you should have. And Dr. Sen also talked about the fact that when you are even building your team to put out that proposal, who is on your team? It's not just that you have a business idea and you put a bunch of your friends on your proposal that you go out there seeking for fun. You have to find the relevant people with technical expertise to form a formidable team to be able to go out there so that if you are the one even committing your money to your team, ask yourself, will you even invest in your team? And it's, it's one way of, of, of going about it. Um, I want to remind our participants on Facebook that you can also put your question there and we'll be able to forward it to our panelists. Um, Kwejo, uh, they said a lot of things. I would want you to address, especially with uh, our young people in the uh, rural uh, communities, um, how do we find funding? Because a lot of the things they are saying, angel investors, do we have angel investors in our rural community or the things we find in Accra and Kumasi and Takradi and in the world? Are they, are, are they in rural communities? How do we find uh, funding in rural communities for our business? Well, all right, so I believe Funding doesn't really discriminate whether you are in the rural area or you're in the urban area. Um, but let me go back to what something Dr. Senna said, that she always finds entrepreneurs who are looking for money, and then she finds investors who have money, but then there's a mismatch. So there are issues on the supply side. That one, I don't think we can go in now because uh, that's a whole thing for policymakers and others to address. But there are also demand side issues. That's why investors are unable or unwilling to invest in entrepreneurs. And I think those are issues that are within uh, the purview of the current discussions we are having, and we can look at some of them. So first of all, um, John talked about the individual. So basically, money follows the name, not the idea. So as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, will people be confident to put their money in you? So it doesn't necessarily have to be you. It can come about as a result of the team you put together or a network of advisors who people can even trust. And because they believe in you, people will be willing to invest in you. So, Entrepreneurs must be willing to grow a network that inspires confidence in the idea they have. You might have the most brilliant idea, but if people don't actually know you and trust you, trust me, and you nobody will put a penny or a pesos behind the idea you have. So let's try to build a formidable team. Let's try to have a network of advisors, mentors, who people can trust and are willing 
to, um, to trust on their word. Once they say, oh, this man is very good, then they will be willing to, uh, so build a formidable team, have a network of advisors, build a good network, and um, uh, money will hopefully thrive. But then we still have to look at the types of capital that uh, John talked about. I'll not go back into them. But so you look at the types of capital and align it to the stage of the business in which you are. So if you are, you have just finished opportunity identification and you are validating, you don't walk into a universal bank in Ghana and say they should give you a loan. Nobody will give you a loan. Yes, because you have not validated. You don't have any tra traction. And then we also have to look at one thing which I always say, records keeping. So I've worked with uh, enterprises that have operated for well over four or five years. You are preparing them for investment and now you are still working on assumptions. After four or five years, you should have some track record that we can build on and do projections. But then you are still working on assumptions on things that should be acting we need to be deliberate and keep records. Now, technology is here with us. You can have accounting apps on your smartphone and be keeping records, inventory, and all those things. So as entrepreneurs, we need to work on the demand side. It's very critical. So you meet a lot of investors, they have the money, but then there are no entrepreneurs because the businesses don't have good uh, corporate governance structures. The entrepreneurs themselves don't have a good team. They don't have records. So we should work on those. Once we work on those, and then we identify the right type of capital for the state of business in which we are, then that's a good start. Uh, despite all the challenges that are there, that will be a good start for you to make a headway. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Kredjo. We've learned a lot on the finance. So I'll go over to our comment session. I have two questions. There was, there was a first one by Paul uh, Opoku and Koma. And Paul was asking about, um, since we are in the COVID period, naturally as a result of the, the COVID risks, people are not so receptive to meeting strangers. So we're talking about, um, uh, if, if you, you, you want to start an idea, you, you, you may have to reach your potential customer. So he was asking about, if you have an idea and you want to sell it to your potential customers, how do you even reach them? Because now people, people are not so receptive when it comes to meeting people face to face for interaction. And then we also had a question from um, Ewenam. Uh, can I, uh, okay, no. And Ewenam's question was about um, starting something in the hospitality and tourism industry. It was about starting something in the hospitality and tourism industry and yeah, okay. So she said, in the light of COVID-19, what advice do you have for someone thinking of starting a business in the hospitality and tourism industry? So now this moves us to our, our next session where we want to talk about um, a few tips on how young people can navigate the business environment. So this one, from your professional experiences and your own personal experiences as entrepreneurs, with people trying to market something to um, potential uh, customers, starting a business in the uh, hospitality and tourism industry and all that. Can you please share some tips on how to go about navigating the whole business uh, environment as a new entrepreneur? Um, who hasn't spoken? <laughs> Dr. Sena, you know I'm definitely coming over to you. So we'll so, start yeah. <laughs> The, the rule we established. Um, so with, with this, the, the question about the, the tourism, the tourism, the person asking about tourism industry, um, the conversation we've been having or the crust of the conversation we've been having so far is the fact that you need to assess that there's a need for what it is that you are coming up with. Um, you need to look within the value chain that you are interested in going into. The tourism industry is said to be one of the hardest hits by the pandemic. Now, in light of that, 
my question to usually i'm very careful when someone comes to me and says asana what are the things that i can look at right you need to do your own research and you need to own it um so pardon the teacher in me <laughs> but basically it's very important that you look at this value chain so what is happening within the tourism sector who is suffering and who is still making it why are they still making it and how are they making it usually i love using the 5 w's and h the who where why what and then how um it's a great tool now use a tool like that or any other tool that you are comfortable with either a swot analysis or anything to actually unpack the entire industry now in this unpacking which you can do on a mind map or on a journey map or i i love drawing things um draw this so that you can see it and then look at where there are opportunities so where are there gaps what are people trying to do within the tourism sector now that you can take advantage of um let me cite an example by veering off tourism so there's this organization called asoriba that has like a church application and you know bef- um of course there were no church activities and all of that now on the night that the president announced that churches could start with 100 people and all of that and lay the protocols for what it is that they should do less than 5 hours later asoriba released um some press release of sorts telling how they are supporting the president's directive so in the application now they were taking um data of people who were going to churches they were they had a part a new part of their application that was going to help with contact tracing they they had all of that figured out now asoriba is an existing organization within a pandemic era understanding the challenges and the potential opportunities that are going to come when finally we lift the lockdown and all of that understanding this and appreciating this they were able to anticipate they were able to anticipate what challenges or potential challenges there could be and so what they should do now immediately they release this now what that tells you about asoriba is that they were following happenings and events and occurrences and they were thinking ahead right and so for someone who is already in business it's not just thinking about what you are doing right now but it's also thinking about what innovations you can come up with and for new people who want to start what is going on within the space what is happening what are some of the directives that are coming up what can you do to improve you know what to improve the 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 stakes the 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 situation of people and to make people's lives better right those are the things that you should be looking out for and those are the things that you should be exploring and so i would say that go back to the basics go back to opportunity entrepreneurship go back to research and go back to looking at what opportunities there are it shouldn't be a fact that i have always wanted to do this it should be that there is this opportunity in the space and so i am going out there to to explore it um with the so that is a tourism one i forget the other one that you mentioned um but then basically it's going back to the basics going through the process of um identifying and exploring the opportunities very well um validating this making sure that you are starting lean and taking advantage of the gaps within the value chains that way you'll be able to take advantage of what is going on otherwise you will live within your head and your business will just live within your head and you will not be able to you know go out there go out there with it all right thank you very much sena so um kwejo can you please respond to the question by paul as to how you re- you reach uh, potential customers to sell your new ideas to since now uh, as a result of covid it's it's difficult to reach out to people so we didn't get the the covid contest how do we reach out to people if we want to sell our new ideas to them all right thank you very much ito so i i think um in the midst of covid we also have technology thankfully so there are a lot of technologies around where where you can use to conduct even market research so a lot of sabanki forms that to conduct um, 
market research and reach out to uh, customers. WhatsApp, all the social media platforms are also available for uh, conducting research and reaching out to your customers. But there are instances where you have to do in person. So for example, if you are, you are validating your product and you want to sell it to a few customers, you need to sometimes do in person. And that is where we don't have to downplay the reality. We need to recognize it and adapt all the protocols that have been established to ensure that we live uh, to uh, see our businesses thrive. So we can adopt technology, but where we have to, as of necessity, do an in-person meeting, we have to make sure all the protocols that have been established by the health experts and by the public agencies are well adhered to, and then we will be able to overcome. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, I would want to remind our participants that we will be doing uh, um, audio or video questions. So if you have a question that you want to, you want us to see you or hear your voice, you can raise your mm -hmm. hand and then when we get there, we will call you to ask your question. So someone wants to add on to what Pedro has said about the delivery. Yeah, um, just wanted to, to hint that Delivery, delivery is your channel, right? So going back to the basics, delivery is your channel. And typically for every business model, you'd have certain channels laid out for you. Now, this channel is best out of what it is that your customers need. So you don't come up with a channel by yourself, but it's a channel that will work for your customers. Now you're looking at your customer type, you're looking at their situation, their constraints, their needs um, for convenience and all of that, and you're making a decision around what channel you are going to use. So COVID, no COVID, it's very important that the core of what your channel becomes is actually your customer and not what you are comfortable doing. Now within the, the limitations of COVID, then of course, there's an the issue of face-to-face. If you need, absolutely need to do face-to-face, -face, you are respecting the protocols um, and you are exploring what else exists. Now, one of the things that I've realized trying to use a lot of um, delivery, so like I said, I'm stuck home with um, two little, little children, <laughs> toddlers. So I can't really go out and be comfortable and do the things that I usually do. And so I'm relying a lot on people delivering stuff to me at home. Now, one of the key missing links that I'm realizing um, from the perspective of a lot of the businesses that I am using is a link between the business itself and the delivery agency, right? So this business is telling you that a, um, a delivery person is gonna call you at a certain time to deliver within a certain period. And usually it doesn't work out seamlessly like that. And there are a lot of hitches in there. My last experience was I don't eat meat. And my last experience was ordering um, jollof rice with um, tilapia and being given kinke with pork. Now that really, like, that really messed up my day <laughs> because I didn't cook that afternoon and that was what my children were going to eat. And now I had kinke and pork and it was already 2 p.m. Now that is the degree of inconvenience that we, we, we put our customers in if we don't coordinate those activities very well. So one key thing that I want everyone who is either venturing out or is already in business to think about when they think delivery is to think about making it smooth as well. So don't just think about finishing your part and thinking that I've sent it through the channel so the channel is gonna get it there. No, work through the channel and make sure that you have actually thought through how this channel will deliver end to end and that convenience and the expectations of the customer is um, achieved. Otherwise you stand to lose a customer. Now the other side of this equation is actually getting customers. Now you, um, I like using the example of Vodafone Red. So I have heard of Vodafone Red so many times through various channels, like through um, what TV, radio ads, it's all over. Have I ever used Vodafone Red? No. Will I ever use Vodafone Red? Well, now, they haven't been able to convert me as a customer, right? And a lot of times when we put messages out there, the parts that we do not think through very well as young entrepreneurs is the conversion. 
And conversion usually costs money and it costs time. So it's very important that as you plan your business model, you actually think about this converting a customer properly. So it's not just a channel to deliver, but it's a channel to inform you about your business. And it is core of it is that conversion. Some people will say it's your sales. Some will say it's marketing and sales together and all of that. But you need really to invest in your ability to do that conversion of somebody hearing about your business and actually patronizing your business. And um, the channels, are they are bound. If you, you are tech savvy and you're in an urban area, they are bound. Now, if you are within the rural context, then of course, around you are some of those limitations. Now, um, I remember from Maso, one of our participants um, started like a link, a LinkedIn, whatnot, like putting ads on LinkedIn and all of that for a printing business in one of our communities. I mean, it was great that he was up on LinkedIn and he was doing all of that. But my feedback to him was, the people you are targeting are not on LinkedIn. So really, you are missing the point there. So it, it's good for something. You are getting visibility within a certain space that could improve perhaps your chances of um, raising capital in the future and all of that. But you still need to focus a bit more on the people around you. Now, within that context, what are some of the things that work? They have these information centers. They have people who go around. Um, you can do like um, fiscal deliveries as well. But in all of that, just making sure that you are observing the protocol. And sometimes it's even just educating people about what the, the situation going on that gets you on their mind as a business they should patronize in the future, right? So when we think channel, let's think about, you know, telling people about us, let's think about actually delivering and let's think about converting as well and plan those three things in very good detail and be sure that we have it all covered. Because once you mess that up, you are giving your customer a bad experience and with that bad experience, they are not going to come back to you and that is money lost, right? So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Senna. And um, so um, I think in the course of our conversation, in terms of uh, reaching potential customers, we mentioned that uh, in the midst of uh, COVID-19, we technology is here to support us. I want us to explore the, the role of digitization and doing business in COVID-19. I mean, uh, in this era, there's been emphasis on the promotion of e-commerce, e-banking, uh, delivery of uh, services, a lot of inno innovation and new technologies. Now we attend church online. Even this conversation that we are having today, we planned to have this on 16th March in person. We're hoping to all meet together at a location where we will talk, have breakout session, have our usual snacks and lunch, talk, around tables, but unfortunately we have to move it online. Um, how can, what role does technology or digitization play in doing business in this era? Especially that now we have young people who have sort of new ideas, they've got funding, they've started their businesses. How would they um, take advantage of digitization in this era? And uh, with this one, I would want John to, to start with it. I thought Kojo start, but let me see if I can speak to that <laughs> topic. I think it's important to understand the era that we're in, that um, Africa has largely been a brick and mortar society. So we like in-person uh, facilitations than, than having to shop online and so on. So while more penetration may be high, the usage and so on is limited in terms of actual translation to actual buying and selling on the platforms that we have be it from e-commerce, be it from delivery services, among others. So, but what we foresee is that that sector will continue to grow depending on how the understanding of the, the customer and its use and what channels will be good for the customer. For example, that a bank rolls out um, an app for banking, but then the woman in, in, in my village somewhere has a Symbian phone. How does she interact with the system? So perhaps a, a, a dichotomy of using USSD against apps would be better than you know, having to, to look at those things. So we've got to look at that. We've got to look at the conversation around, I've, I've seen some, some banks that are even using Zoom and Co to, to, to organize their annual general meetings. 
you've got to look at as a business, if you are adopting technology as an enabler or a facilitator. So enabler platforms are essentially that, are there integrations within my business that can be digitized? In terms of like, Koji was mentioned, sales tracking, am I using Salesforce, am I using Slack, am I using Trello, and so on and so forth. That is, this is even for the top line business. Then you're looking at account integration and so on and so forth. Do I migrate in, onto a cloud-based platform like Wave, like Zeros and so on and so forth, be able to handle my, my bookkeeping? So here yeah, you've got to look at it as an enabler in terms of your core functions as a business, inventory management and so on and so forth. How does technology help me grow my top line? As a facilitator, you've got to look at as a business, does my business model require that I put my business online? If I'm going to put it online, what other channels do I need to put it on? So do I need an e-commerce site, for example? Do I need, and then what, what goes into the design of that platform? So if you are an aggregator of a sort, and what you do is you buy from X party who is in, in Sawang, and you supply to X party who is an off taker, then it's pretty simple to assume that you just buy and then go and deliver a product. But when you are prospecting for clients, prospecting for new people who want to create a platform that allows digital exchanges, then you are looking at one in the middle, can I be a broker for people who are looking for goods to sign up on my platform and people who are producing to be on that platform to facilitate digital exchanges. Then along the value chain, you are looking at whether or not, you know, I want to be a payment uh, integrated. Now there are, there are laws around that and so on and so forth in terms of opportunities for, for, for digital payments. But there are APIs that you can always plug onto to be able to facilitate. And today when they build websites for you, they can easily put those APIs on. Then in terms of core marketing itself, Doc mentioned a number of it, which is in terms of the conversion analysis. It's not just good to say I'm posting on social media uh, or I'm creating a, a web, a, a shop online and so on and so forth. There are core things that go if you want to do proper marketing, there's AdSense, AdWords, how many people know these things in terms of going digital. Now, digital does not also mean essentially just web and app based. I was telling a client that I had I have in Kanishi Market that, oh, I was going to speak Gam, but a lot of people don't, don't, don't understand Gam. She sells tomatoes and things, and people like to order from her. And I said, what if you were to link up with an Okada guy, and whenever you have the order, you know, you can tell your clients that, oh, don't come on this day. I will simply call my guy to deliver onto you. There's a back end on what the cost structure will look like to digitize as well. Then, so I'll leave it here as to the enabler facilitator type, understanding the con consumer and what channel will be good to reach the consumer through, understanding in terms of your business structure, which areas you can integrate technology, ERP solutions among others to grow, and also be careful in rolling out the tab because it's a cost to it. So understand the psyche that while a lot of your consumers are now migrating online, it may take time to onboard and so on and so forth. And then you can look at a business in construction like this, what will it need digital for? It could be for internal. But assuming they want to, want to look at new lines, new product development lines and say, let's create an online market where people can actually trade and, 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 and invest in our property, or, or rent from us, or even onboard others to bring in their property, they would want to pursue digital. Thank you very much, John. And um, so you, you've given us a, a good picture of what goes. You don't just start and say, okay, now digitization is the way to go. So I'm moving my business online. You need to have a good understanding of the kind of business you are doing, who your customers or your clients are. Are they even online? It's not because it's COVID-19 period, so now everything is, is web, now everything is Zoom. You need to have a good understanding of what you are doing. And then one thing I like about what John said is that it takes time sometimes to build um, some of these things. So if you started and then you, you just started and you are not getting good feedback from your customers or your consumers, don't, get, don't, don't worry. Sometimes it takes time to build um, that support base or that client base um, online. Um, we should be getting close to ending our conversation, but before that, I would want us to briefly talk about um, digital literacy. And to, um, I, I really enjoyed what John said about the fact that it's not all about uh, uh, internet or web. His good example of the market woman and how she could 
uh, communicate and work with um, an Okada or a dispatch rider to deliver some of the things. It's a very good example of digitization. Sometimes we normally think about, okay, then we need internet because we are aware that there are issues of um, uh, digital divide. Even in the rural, even in, in urban areas and rural communities, so we have huge issue with connectivity, access to um, internet infrastructure issues when it comes to um, using um, internet to do our businesses. But we also know that we can take, it's, it's all about being innovative and looking at what works uh, for you. So um, we have a question on construction. And I would want us to, to respond to, to that question. Uh, Dr. Senna knows that question is definitely going to her because I know she's in construction. So the construction sector usually requires huge capital investments. If I want to start a business in, the, in that sector during this COVID-19 era, will it be a good idea bearing in mind the fact that the, fall, the failing can be suicidal with the amount of money that may be lost. So somebody is asking whether it's a good idea to go into construction because it demands huge capital. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you. The construction industry is very traditional in its ways, in its delivery, in how it's, it's a very traditional industry. And um, it's very important that when we are starting businesses, and I've said this, I've said this, so I'm worried I was saying it again, but let me just say it again. It's very important that you understand the space you are going into and understand the value chain, right? I think that is core. Cool. Now, this is a very traditional industry. This is an industry with players who do not want to change, an industry within which it's very difficult to disrupt, right? Now, when you're entering an industry like that, you should know what the limitations are going into this kind of industry. Now, as a young person going into construction, I mean, there are different, there are different sides to, to, to the construction industry. You could go into um, actually like constructing, or you could look at some of the, the other opportunities that are on the periphery of construction itself. Now, what I would advise this person is don't just, don't just sit back and think that I want to go into construction. Same thing I said to the person in tourism. Understand the industry. What is the value chain now? What are the challenges in there? What are the gaps in there? And what opportunities are in this for you, right? Um, so the question is, what do we mean by it's traditional? So, okay, within our context, within the Ghanaian context, there are two sides to it. There's a real estate companies um, so there's two core sides to it. There's a real estate companies who are building um, estates and selling and all of that. And then there's the individuals who will venture into a building project and spend five to 10 years finishing um, and building their dream house and moving into it when all their children have left. So their dream doesn't hold again and all of that. Anyway, that's another conversation. But basically there's those two major parts. Now, if you want to enter an industry that has such a strong holding on two major blocks with things like um, going into management and um, estate facility management and you know even brokerage and all of that not being very 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 um, what's the word it, they are not as they are not as heavily rooted as the building side of construction. Now, if you want to go into the building side of construction, then of course you are thinking capital intensiveness. You are thinking about you need to get all the materials, you need to get land, we know our land issues, you are paying for it two or three times. Um, you need to get, it's heavy labor intensive and all of that. So it becomes very heavy when you look at the capital you need to go in. Now, my question is, to this particular person who is posing the question is, is there a gap there? Are people struggling to put, out, to put up their buildings? Are estate companies struggling? And what are the challenges they are facing? That creates a gap that you, a young person, can tap into. For individuals who are building their own dream houses, what are some of the challenges they are facing? What are the gaps that is existing within their value chain, value de the delivery value chain? And how can you plug in? For other people who do not have the funds to build and they are looking to rent, or people who have access to mortgages and they are looking to buy, 
what are the challenges within that mortgage delivery chain or that rental delivery chain? So that when we think construction, let's not just think about putting, putting up the building. Let's think about what else is within that delivery chain that is challenged, that we can take advantage of, that is challenged, that people are looking for solutions to. There are lots of people who are looking for things like um, interior decoration, right? I mean, if you're like me, you get bored after one year of living in a space and you want to see something different in there. But I am not creative. Well, I call myself a non-creative. So what do I put where to do what? When I see the beauty, I admire it and I know this is what I want. But if you ask me what I want, I don't know it, right? So I need help like that. Um, there are people who are looking for short-stay apartments in various areas. So places that are furnished and are well-located and they can use that as, you know, um, you know to bridge their lives um, either for work or for leisure or pleasure or whatnot. So there are other needs within the construction industry that will not necessarily be heavy when it comes to cost. Now, I would advise someone who is going into this industry to sort of explore and look beyond, you know, look beyond building, look beyond being a real estate company, putting up a building. And let's look at how we can disrupt this very traditional industry in a way in which the players of the industry and the people who need the services of the industry will appreciate. Remember, entrepreneurship is not about you. What I tell my students all the time is that you don't matter. Your desires don't matter in this, in this game. What matters in this game? Of course, you are looking at um, what you can deliver and all of that. But what you desire to see as the output is not the important thing. But it is how that output is addressing the need of the person you are serving, right? So customer is thin. I like to put that in your head. Um, remember that and look for how you can address the needs of the customer and think beyond some of the very traditional ways. Like don't think tradition, um, construction and think building. Don't think tourism and think hotel. Don't think, you know, think, think, don't think a Greek and just think farming. Um, even if you are thinking farming, think mechanized farming. Think about ways in which you can, you know, turn things around. Let's let's think beyond. Let's let's go a little beyond the norm. Like the otherwise, like Marina said in his comments, then it's it's very boring and very I don't know. Entrepreneurs look for excitement, and I don't look for the other things. So construction is not always. Let me come back. <laughs> construction is not always capital intensive. Look for the things that on the periphery of construction or even within construction that are needs. So I had a, a team in my class that just this past academic year that was looking at access to building materials because there are all these real estate companies, there are private people who are building. So Senna is building, she's busy, she has a thousand and one things to do. Can I go to someone who is selling towels or cement to go buy? Now, if I can get an online market, a construction online market, where I am assured of pricing, reliable um, quality, and all of that, would I love it? Absolutely. Now, is that capital intensive? No, you're connecting, right? You're connecting the players. So think about value chain. Don't think about product. Think value chain. And let's see how we can actually, you know, take advantage of the gaps. And Ethel is smiling. I need to keep quiet, but yes. <laughs> Hope the point is made. <laughs> the conversation is getting interesting. We get lots of questions from our participants, but we have just seven minutes to go. I'm sorry, but we, we, we are not just ending this conversation. And um, we will take your questions and kindly forward all your questions or your comments or any other topics that you want us to discuss to info at yseg.org. Yseg is uh, Y-S-E-G. Y for youth, um, S for sector, E for engagement, G for group. So info at yseg.org. We, we find it right there in the chat um, room. So kindly forward your questions anything that comes up. And if you have any topics that you want us to discuss, you can forward it uh, to that, uh, 
to our email and then when we have collated that we can organize another panel and then we could have another discussion in future um, so uh, I think we, we received there was another question on the construction sector I will mention it so that in your final thoughts you can try to address some of, of these and then we had um, Na Na Duamepo, sorry if I did not pronounce your name well, and she's saying in the construction sector, um, can you still apply what Dr. Senna said about going lean, that is starting a small subcontract for small portions of the building, which may not require a major capital, and then you scale up. So we will pack it there, and then when they are given their final submission, they can talk about it. And we have a question from Peace, Peace in Ghana, all the way from Uganda. And Peace is asking, is asking the young women still face a disadvantage in access to business development and support opportunities, including access to capital, access to business development services, technology, and so on. How can we address this gap, especially when we face we are facing the effects of COVID-19 on small businesses. So my panel is, please make sure that in your last submission, you address some of uh, this issue. So we'll take it, we'll try. One minute per person, and <laughs> please try and be very brief. I know we've talked a lot today from construction to information technology to a grade to starting a business. It's, it's been a loaded uh, session. Please, what are your final thoughts in starting and running a business in the COVID-19 era and beyond? Just give it to us in one minute. And we will start with John. John, try hard, one minute. <laughs> to answer please, uh, Doc should start first, she's a lady, so. Oh, okay, okay. John, <laughs> John. No, it's not, it's not, she just finished talking. Mm -hmm. She just finished talking, so I think John, just give it to us in one minute. Okay, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> so we can wrap up. Um, a couple of things I would say. First, I would say that be flexible in your heart. And um, the things that you are passionate about, be flexible and um, listen to what your environment is saying to you. Listen to your customers, listen to the people around you, and be flexible to iterate if you need to. And be flexible in your mind as well. And then look out for opportunity. Now, in the business value chain, usually it rises and it falls. Um, the only way you can keep rising is if every time it looks like it's going to fall, you actually innovate and you rise. And then when it's going to fall, you keep rising. Um, so always look for opportunity um, to innovate. And two readings I'll leave you with. One is um, Dublin's 10 types of innovation. And the other is Roger's innovation diffusion model. Um, those are very good for, you know, when you're starting up and, and all that. Now to pieces, I think I've done 30 seconds. So to pieces um, question on um, young women. I mean, I am sitting at home. Um, I am struggling. It's difficult. I stay up all night just to get work done because during the day I am taking care of my children. Now we have so many barriers um, that you know, are in front of us. My appeal to our men, if they can hear me, is that the societal backdrop that we are all working on called the family, it's a partnership. There's nothing that is woman and there's nothing that is man. Let's work on it together. Let's split the chores. Let's do everything together so that we can also achieve our goals. If you love us, do that for us. Now, when it comes to opportunity out there, that is um, in spaces like, you know, just um, getting access to capacity building, getting access to funding and all of that. There are some organizations that are intentional about supporting women, so that's great. Um, but there's also, you know, the reality of it that a lot of times um, it's, it's difficult for women to get access to. And so I would say that as women, we need also to support each other. We are asking the men to support us because they love us. We should love ourselves and support each other. Let's make sure that I am speaking to Ethel and asking Ethel what her challenges are and having a conversation with, let's have women little conversations and groupies to support each other. I'll leave the technical things for the men to talk about, but let's support each other to make it happen so that Ethel's not can actually, but please, very essential. Men support us and let's support each other 
um, yeah. I have a lot more to say, but yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You've come beyond your, your one minute, but it's okay. Um, we, we will go to John. John, are you ready now? Okay. So okay. I'm glad that we have power and one minute, which is in a, in a, a way to answer um, Kisa's question. Let me end by saying that, look, um, starting a business is not easy. A lot of businesses may fail. Um, will fail at this point given COVID. And we've got to realign the way we think about doing business um, going forward. My advice is one, let's be focused on what we are doing. There are products that we are in investing money in that are bringing us 1% of revenue. Take advantage of COVID to have a frank conversation with yourself. Do I quit and start all over? Or do I keep doing the old things and fail? For many businesses, think product development in the context of, you know, how do I change? Can I use my existing line to create new products? What part of the value chain can I focus on? Be deliberate about that thought action. Number two, pursue cost rationalization. Which part of my business should I be reducing cost? I think of it more from what key resources do I need within my business that I can keep and which areas can I shed off so that then once you lower overheads and lower operational costs, you can then, then begin to ramp up in your business resumption strategy as you go along. Number three, pursue partnerships and networks. This is a good time to build your relationships, invest in client management systems, invest also in knowing who and who are moving things and which doors they can open for you, but invest more in yourself as a capacity builder and invest in what value you have that others can connect to, to be able to attract capital, to be able to attract the needed space that you're in. Build your knowledge about systems that are working within the process right now, be it digitization, be it business development, be it access to capital, among others, this is a good time for you to do that and for your staff and employees as well. Think of governance and internal controls. How do I improve my systems as a business? How do I improve bookkeeping? How do I get, if you don't have audited accounts, how do I interpret financial statements from the past, management accounts and so on and so forth, to be able to be clear about what lines and what good looks like for you. Finally, integrity. Focus on integrity. If you don't have integrity, no one will give you money, no one will trust you, and no one will do business with you. So have integrity, and then you should be fine. I think these will be my closing remarks. I like how Doc has been nodding, nodding. I love it. Okay. Thank you very much. Pedro, one minute. Give us your final thoughts based on everything we've discussed today. All right. So my final thoughts will be, as an entrepreneur, first of all, you need to have a plan to develop your own self. So a personal development plan, build your entrepreneurial skills. If you are going into business, the first question you ask yourself is, what is the need? What problem are you solving? Understand your customers, match your solution to what the customers want, so there's a service or product market fit. And then um, let's also leverage technology in the things we are doing. Uh, whether it's agriculture, whether it's whatever value chain, let's understand the value chain, let's leverage technology. And then finally, what I will say to us all is that we need to understand the reality in which we are and be deliberate about it. Let's have a plan to deal with it. And then let's also think beyond COVID if we are doing business because definitely COVID will go. So how does our business survive post-COVID? So is our business scalable beyond post-COVID or our business is just in terms to take care of needs within the COVID uh, era? So basically that, that, that's, that will be my thoughts. Let's think beyond COVID. Let's have a personal development plan. Let's leverage technology and let's innovate, 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 innovate. That is what will make us survive now and be all right so um thank you very much uh to everyone uh participants our panelists it's been such an educative session and there's something that i learned from dr Sennett's class that i'm going to share with all of you and then as you can see now um there is a traditional, what we call the traditional Adinkra symbols in Ghana. And you can, what you see is, is a crocodile. Please accept it. It's a crocodile. It's a design of a crocodile. And it's called Denchem. Denchem 
is a, is, is in the Akan language Chi, and it's, it means crocodile. And in Chi, there is a saying, this symbol is from the Akan proverb that says that, um, which means that the crocodile lives in water, yet it grieves. And I, it, it breathes air. I learned this from Dr. Senna's entrepreneurship class that as an entrepreneur, you have to be able to adapt. It's a symbol of adaptability and cleverness. So even though we are in COVID-19 season, we are now in the water and we are surrounded by water, you should be able to breathe. When we move to the land, which is the regular times too, you should be able to breathe. So it's about um, using all the knowledge and the things we've learned today to be able to start something for yourself. And in, I think in summary, it's about people invest in people. So no matter what you plan to do, you have to make sure that you are deliberate about what you are doing. You invest first in yourself. You build good skills, you build good team, you make sure that you seek knowledge so that you understand what business is all about. If you want to do something, don't sit in your small corner alone. Go out there. There are people who have gone before you, done the same thing and made mistakes. Go to them, learn from them. There are so many resources online. You know, Dr. Sana talked about two books. We will put them there to go find them, read. This is a period to learn and develop yourself. And documentation, again and again and again. Kojo talked about it. If you want to seek funding, we want to look at your track record. Whatever you are doing, people will want to see what you have done in the past. So even if you started even a small business, make sure that even with the little things that you are doing, you are documenting. You may not see the importance now, but in future, when you are looking for the juicy contracts to take to fund a uh, financing and other contracts, we will, it will be of use to you. So thank you very much for joining us today. We are looking forward to receiving your emails at info at um, ricec.org. Send us your comments, send us feedback on this program, if there's something we have to improve on. And then send us, most importantly, topics that you want us to discuss and you'll hear from us soon. Thank you, stay safe and take good care of yourselves and take good care of your businesses. Talk to you soon, bye.